because I am not Heather, as you probably noticed, and I don't usually do this program. Mm -hmm. um, I have a few announcement to make, announcements to make before we get started. The Galleries and Bookstore at Library Square will shut its doors on Wednesday, May 31st at 5 p.m. to make way for the Roberts Library to house a mini main while the main library undergoes its major renovation. All gently read books in the bookstore are now $2 for hardbacks and $1 for paperbacks with the exception of a one shelf of special things that are more pricey still. And most merchandise is now 50% off and Mark Rademacher Pottery is 40% off. If you want to sign up for our email list to get information about all of our programs and events, see Madeline here in room 124. We have a sign up on the table with the snacks. And please consider donating to the foundation to support programs at the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. You can go to robertslibrary.org or encyclopediaofarkansas.net to give a one-time or monthly recurring donation, and your support is greatly appreciated. Today's talk is being live streamed on YouTube and will be available to view on the CALS YouTube channel immediately following the program. Today's speakers will answer questions at the end of the session. If you're, if you're joining us via Zoom, please type your questions in the chat box and we'll address them during the Q&A at the end. In honor of Arkansas Heritage Month, we're joined today by David Ware and Katie Atkins for exploring the Arkansas Digital Newspaper Project. Since colonial times, newspapers have served as front row observers of American life. The paper doesn't last forever. America's old news has long been preserved by microfilming, but now new technology brings new expectation and access. In partnership with the National Endowment for the Humanities and the Library of Congress, staff at the Arkansas State Archives are working to digitize historic Arkansas newspapers, keeping the old news vital and delivering it online to users across the country and around the world. Katie Atkins is project director of the Arkansas Digital Newspaper Project at the Arkansas State Archives. She leads a team of archivists, historians, and technical services vendors who are digitizing historic Arkansas newspapers for the Library of Congress's National Digital Newspaper Program and Chronicling America. David Ware served from 2001 through 2019 as historian of the Arkansas State Capitol. Since January 2020, he has been Arkansas State Historian and Director of the State Archives. Please give David and Katie a warm welcome. <laughs> Thanks. Shall I go forward? Yes. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you for coming out uh, this lunchtime when it's glorious outside. Here we are inside enjoying air conditioning and, and cold drinking water. What could be better? Um, we're delighted to be here today, both to promote our agency, which is one of the oldest agencies in state government, and also our embrace of the new in the form of our participation in the National Digital Newspaper Project. Now, as some of you probably know, uh, we are one of the oldest state agencies. We were established by the General Assembly in 1905, created largely through the efforts of Professor John Hugh Reynolds of the University of Arkansas. It wasn't until 1911 that the agency, known then as the Arkansas History Commission, hired its first employee a young ABD from the University of Chicago named Dallas Herndon, who never quite got back to finishing his dissertation, but yeah, he, he had other things to do. Basically, he spent the next few decades amassing a matchless collection of materials reflecting Arkansas's history. Um, and he wrote to his old advisor, the commission exists to gather the records of all of Arkansas's local and state activities past, present, and future, future to preserve and classify these records and to make them accessible to the public. And working single-handedly for much of his time as the secretary of the Arkansas History Commission, he made great strides. The problem was he was a great collector and records take up space. He outgrew the initial off the offices of the History Commission in the state capitol. In 1951, he oversaw the move of the History Commission from the new capitol um, down to the west wing of the previous one, the old state house, recently semi-refurbished at that time. There, the History Commission stayed until 1979 when it was moved into new modern quarters in the multi-agency complex known as Big Mac today, uh, the flat building right behind the capitol. Um, the one for which a fishing pond was sacrificed, uh, which I still got complaints about during my time at the Capitol. Um, what we are, we are technically today called the Arkansas State Archives. 
What we are is a sort of an interesting amalgam of things. We are one part special collections library, one part manuscript repository, one part government records repository, when government agencies can be persuaded to give their records to us. Um, and we have a diverse collection. Our holdings include somewhere north of a half million photographs, approximately 4,000 manuscript collections, large and small, various military records, land records, over 5,000 maps, about 30,000 books, about 8,000 audio recordings, um, which come from the collections of the Ozark Folk Center, uh, another 8,000 pieces or so of sheet music, again, from the Ozark Folk Center, about 10,000 artifacts, because, well, these things just, they, they arrive on our doorstep. Actually, Dallas Herndon collected them for an eventual great Arkansas State Museum that has never quite been created. Uh, we have a significant quantity of them in the basement of, of the, um, the Big Mac building, including Henry Rector's death mask, a physician's urns, and the original uh, draft version of the Arkansas State flag. One of these days, these things are going to get out in the light of day. People are going to be amazed. And oh, yes, we have microfilm. Lots of microfilm. About 11,000 rolls of county records, 4,000 rolls of military record microfilm, and somewhere around 23,000 rolls of microfilmed newspapers, journals, and serials, some 3,000 titles, including about 1,700 Arkansas serial publications, mostly newspapers. Now, you might ask, why so much microfilm? It is a medium with a history. Um, I will confess a certain bias in favor of microfilm. In 1975, my first job in history was creating microfilm for the Nebraska State Historical Society, um, spending long hours in a dark room in front of a very clunky camera, punching a button, adjusting exposure, adjusting the focus, and then having to proofread all the reels that I shot, which is a great, it's a great incentive to get it done right the first time so you don't have to splice in your corrections. Microfilm is an amazing, mature medium. The first practical use of microfilm, it dates back in experimental forms back to the 1830s, 1840s. In the 1920s, a banker named George McCarthy came up with a device he called the Checograph. The idea was to make compact, uh, preservable copies of banking records. 1928, the great yellow father, Eastman Kodak, bought McCarthy's invention and began to market it under the name of Recordac. Funny how they managed to get the act into almost everything. In the 1930s, they developed what would become one of the great mules of record keeping, the Recordac planetary camera, a 35 millimeter microfilm camera, um, perfected almost so much so that it's, it stayed in production largely unchanged for many decades. Um, Kodak begins filming the New York Times. Um, one way to preserve this, to make it available to libraries across the country in relatively compact form. During the 1930s, we see various academic and commercial microfilming projects beginning. Harvard University in 1930 starts seeking out foreign newspapers, again, to preserve them and make them available in a compact, portable form. During World War II, microphotography was used extensively for espionage for regular military mail. It was also used in Europe in the closing, in the closing months of the war and after the war as a way to preserve records that had been damaged or were otherwise endangered by the changing political climate there as the war came to the end. In the 1950s, we see microfilm expanding the idea of using microfilm not just for preserving things, but also disseminating information, subscriptions of microfilm, uh, microfilm and microfiche, collections of documents regularly updated. The idea was that this would be an evolving, a changing, a developing, and growing way to permanently preserve material. And really not until the 1990s was there a good alternative to preserving material on microfilm because microfilm is, well, the only thing better <laughs> in terms of preserving information is good paper kept out of the sun and the rain or else tablets of gold buried in a hill somewhere. If you can't do either of those, microfilm is it. 
It wasn't really until the 1990s when the possibility of huge digital storage projects became something more than a science fiction writer's dream that microfilm saw competition. Now, microfilm is still our choice for preserving things because it is simple, it is durable. Simple, it doesn't take high technology equipment to retrieve information from microfilm. You can do it with a five buck magnifier that you get at Harbor Freight. And admittedly, this is cumbersome, but yes, you can read microfilm. Don't try this at home, folks, unless you're really desperate or you have nothing to do on a Saturday night, but it can be done because it's a straight optical recovery. It's silver, it's silver emulsion on a stable film base. Today's microfilm on a polyester base, it's estimated to have a 500 year lifespan. Um, not, many, not many of us are going to have um, descendants five years, 500 years from now, we're wondering what was happening on a day-to-day -day basis in the pages of the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, but we're preserving it on the just in case that they might. It's retrievable, it is durable, is a proven easy system for creating it using these lumbering cameras at the top of a tall alloy mast. The problem is searchable, yes, but not easily. And today's researchers, amateur professionals alike want something that's accessible, something that's easier to use. Microfilm searching at its essence consists of somebody sitting in a, a, a room with subdued lighting either looking at an optical reader, the ones I remember were the ones you basically, they had a little window and you looked into it so that you can, so that um, you didn't have too much problem with ambient light. Today, you read it using, for the most part, using um, scanners that bring the image up onto a computer screen, but you're still going through page after page, looking for words, trying to find what's there. It's a pain in the, well, it's a pain in the oculus. Um, and I say this as somebody who has used microfilm for decades and loves it, but you know, just because you love it doesn't mean there isn't something better on the horizon. And that is why I am thrilled. I was thrilled to discover when I came on deck at the State Archives three years ago that the State Archives was the Arkansas partner for the National Digital Newspaper Program and Chronicling America. And since I know enough to let somebody else talk when they know a whole lot more about something than I do, I give you to my colleague, Katie Adkins, who lives and breathes this stuff. With a pause for technical adjustment, of course. There we go. All right. All right. We're going to roll. We're not progressing. Uh, I'll just click into the slideshow. Okay. Um, so today I'm going to give an overview of NDMP and how that relates to Chronicling America. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our team, who we are. Um, we'll talk about some newspapers that we have up online, including um, those we've digitized recently from underrepresented communities. Um, I'll very briefly touch on digitization and what that process is like. Um, <laughs> and then we'll talk a little bit about uh, using Chronicling America for research. I'll include links and resources. And then of course, we'll take questions at the end. Um, NDNP, that's how I'll refer to it, it's easier to say, um, is a partnership between the Library of Congress who manages the um, project and the NEH who uh, funds the project. Um, they started first funding states in 2005. Um, we currently last year, uh, the last state to join was Massachusetts. So now we have all 50 states participating as well as um, Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, 
this project comes on the heels of a previous partnership between the LC and the NEH, which is the U.S. Newspaper Program, which began in 1982 uh, and ended in 2011. So there was some overlap between these programs. Um, that program provided the groundwork for this one. They um, located, um, collected, cataloged, and preserved newspapers from the 18th century uh, to the, the present. Um, I actually was talking to Carrie Cox the other night after um, an awards presentation, and he said he actually worked on the U.S. newspaper program, and he would climb rickety ladders into attics and um, a lot of physical um, retrieval of newspapers. Um, all of that information was then cataloged and stored in the US um, newspaper directory, which we actually use pretty often to locate newspapers um, if we're not sure. If we don't have them in our own collection, we wanna know where they are. I'll show you that in a few minutes. Um, the newspapers that we are digitizing all go on to Chronicling America. Um, the Library of Congress's website is the repository. Um, it's ever growing. Um, Every day there's new content added from all the states and territories. Um, the earliest right now is 1770 uh, up to 1963. Um, with the addition of Massachusetts, there will be some earlier issues, I believe, coming. Um, yes, no copyright problems with those. Correct, correct. So our team is made up of seven people um, at the Arkansas State Archives. Um, we officially joined the program kind of late um, in 2017. We have completed two full cycles. We are currently in our third cycle. Cycles are two years. So if you're doing the math, um, <laughs> we're coming to the end of that um, in August will be the end of the third cycle. We have applied for a fourth additional cycle, um, which would begin in September if we are funded. That particular um, focus will be newspapers that demonstrate the relationship between the environment and the economy in Arkansas, um, beginning with the Arkansas's territorial period around 1819 to the mid-1930s. Um, one of the reasons we were selected is, uh, uh, as David said, we have a vast collection of microfilm in our vaults, um, which is a um, really the foundation of the project, having access to microfilm masters. Um, we currently have an active microfilm department where we are continuing to film current newspapers as well as historic newspapers. We, um, we currently film 109 titles from 66 of the 75 counties in Arkansas. Um, so that's, uh, that's important for, uh, for this project, having access to the film. Some, uh, so the newspapers we digitize, um, typically for each cycle, we have between 100,000 and 110,000 pages per cycle, which is a lot of content. Um, <laughs> we um, will have more like 310,000 by the end of this, uh, by the end of August. Um, the earliest uh, issues come from 1830 all the way up to 1959. And I'm talking specifically about Arkansas newspapers. Um, we have been able to include non-English language content this cycle, which is exciting. Um, it is uh, compared to other states. Um, it sounds like not a lot, <laughs> uh, but it's a win in our book. Uh, exactly. <laughs> Um, we have added German language content as well as Choctaw. We are the first state to add Choctaw language content, currently the only uh, Choctaw content on Chronicling America. Um, so we'll, we'll take that as a win. Should we tell, should we tell some true tales of um, the, the rescue of Das Echo? Yes, so actually, yes. So mm -hmm. some of the papers I've got here, um, the first one, go ahead if you'd like to talk about Echo. No. Um, the Arkansas Echo was one of two long-running German language weekly newspapers mm -hmm. published in Little Rock. Um, and we had a, an edition of the Echo, a run of the Echo on microfilm. Um, I can't remember when it was filmed, probably in the 1970s, was it, Darren? 
And let's just say somebody had a whole bunch of Friday afternoon filming segments <laughs> or Monday morning um, because the microfilm was unfortunate in places. Um, not all microfilm is perfect microfilm. And so there were focus problems, there were exposure problems and so forth. And the problem with um, unsuitable microfilm, low, low, low contrast, so bad focus, is that it cannot be processed for optical character recognition. So it becomes less searchable. One of the features of the site is, yes, it's OCR. You can put in keywords, you can look for things, you can pull things up. It's fun. It's fun. But um, you know, first off, Das Echo is in Proctor, that lovely German funky type. And then it wasn't in very good shape. However, one of our sharp-eyed team members who's sitting in row number two there was reading, I believe, the forward to uh, Professor Condre's book on German press in Arkansas, and noticed that she credited the monks of Subiaco who had allowed her access to or their original preserved copies of Das Echo, because it turns out Das Echo was the Catholic German newspaper. And so the monks at Subiaco had pretty much a, a full run preserved up there on the hill. Um, and we had been doing a, we had been doing a scanning job um, in collaboration with them on, the, on their school, their academy newspaper and other academy, um, at Abbey Publications. And so I very politely asked Father Jerome, their former abbot and now their archivist, might we borrow the echo? And he said, sure. We had, you know, you don't get many do-overs this big in, in your life. This was a big opportunity for a do-over. We could, in fact, correct the filming errors of the 1970s and create new microfilm from original paper copies of Das Echo. Um, we did this, in fact, not using conventional microfilm camera, but instead an overhead scanner. We have a large format Zeuschel scanner, and we use that to capture the pages. We're turning that into microfilm using a truly absurd gadget called an archive writer, which basically takes digital files and converts them into conventional microfilm. You know, it's like taking gold and changing it into lead in some people's eyes. Hey, this lead is durable. Um, but that gives us the digital files. Uh, we're able to better adjust for, var for varying um, color and contrast in the, on the original newspapers to get a crisper image. We're using new technology to create old style microfilm. Go figure. <laughs> but we're very proud of this project. <laughs> so in addition to uh, the language paper we also uh as i mentioned the choctaw language comes from the de queen b de queen is if you're not familiar located um on the southwestern border with oklahoma at the time it was indian territory choctaw nation um which is why we see some choctaw language content printed in the paper i recently did a blog about this relationship between eagle town and and the de queen b um if you're interested, it's on our Arkansas State Archives blog. Um, another important paper um, from an underrepresented community we did this cycle is the State Press, the Arkansas State Press. Um, this might be the most important paper we've digitized um, this cycle, maybe, maybe all the cycles. Um, this is an African-American paper uh, owned by Daisy and Lucius Bates. Um, covering uh, the civil rights movement and in particular the uh, the crisis at Central High in 1957. Um, with the Kearney family's blessing, we were able to get this up um, posted on Cronam. It is now available for you to start researching. Um, lastly, our two women's papers from Little Rock. The first one, which is not shown here, is the um, Little Rock Ladies Journal. Uh, which as it grew changed into the Arkansas Ladies Journal and then changed names again into the Southern Ladies Journal um, before it closed. Uh, the Women's Chronicle opened about a year later. Um, both of these were for women by women newspapers. This one in particular, the Women's Chronicle uh, was significant in terms of the suffrage movement in Arkansas. So,
So digitization, uh, people think it's just a matter of scanning it and throwing it up on online. Um, that is not the reality. It's uh, complicated. It's tedious. It's an expensive process. Um, and it takes a long time from start to finish um, to, to get things mm -hmm. to where it's user friendly for, for everybody. Um, the David touched on this a little bit in terms of the quality of the film. That's one of the main parameters of this project. If we don't have good film, we can't use it. Um, we have specific uh, technical specifications that we have to adhere to um, for our film. So some of it automatically is not um, is not going to be used. Luckily, we were able to find. We're always looking, um, but we were able to find the echo so that we could include that. Um, title selection is another significant part of this project, and David will talk about this a little bit um, later, but we um, we try to select titles that um, represent a, a, a cross section of the state from different areas, different time periods covering different subject matters. Um, we work with a, an advisory board for uh, professionals from around the state to help us um, create a priority list. Once we have that list and we have confirmed that the film, we will move on to the next step, which is collecting metadata. We literally go into every single page of the newspaper and collect um, information about it. The issue date, uh, volume number, issue number, number of pages, page number, um, if it's got a section, if that issue has a section, has section labels, if there's a second edition printed on the same day. We also um, look at anomalies. Uh, sometimes when they filmed, they would film you know, a spread and then they'd refilm it because uh, at a different uh, exposure. So we have to get rid of the duplicate pages. Sometimes they're turned upside down or torn. Um, there's two page spreads, any kind of, um, unique um anything unique about the page we make notes in a spreadsheet and that will be used later for the vendor once they start working with the the data um, we create batches of ten thousand images um, and once we have those we will then send our information to the vendors we have two different vendors one vendor is for the digitization portion the other vendor uh, deals with the actual microfilm, the scanning, and the duplication. For this project, the Library of Congress likes to have a duplicate uh, two-in master negative um, of all the papers we include so that they can put it in their vaults. Um, so after the vendor scans, um, create TIFF files, high-resolution TIFF files, and duplicates. And then they send that information over to the digitization vendors. Um, they then create other additional assets like JP2 files, PDF files, um, XML files, all in an effort to, um, well, the Library of Congress has certain standards and file structures um, that we use to get the information um, so that it can be ingested eventually. Uh, once the vendor is done processing a single batch, they will send it to us for review. <laughs> the review takes uh, one of our team members weeks working on it eight hours a day. Um, so for each batch, um, and she looks at it and makes sure that uh, all the anomalies, all the things have been corrected that we that we've collected in the metadata process. Um, once uh, there's a lot of back and forth during this time um, to replace uh, replace images, fix images that weren't corrected um, previously. Once once we are in agreement that the information looks good, then we will then download the information, um, and then I we do a final review, um, looking at um, different things, file structure, um, XML coding, things like that. Um, once it's ready to go, we put it on a hard drive and send it via FedEx to the Library of Congress. They will then go through a process of reviewing the data, and then they will ingest it into Chronicling America. Um, so it's not a very quick or easy process. It's and an adventure. <laughs> it's an adventure. <laughs> um, 
So once uh, once it's up online, then it's uh, available for research. There are different ways to research using the website. I'm gonna go over some of them. Um, you could search by state, look at it by newspaper if you know a specific uh, paper that you're looking for. There's also an interactive map feature I'm going to show you. Um, so we'll click over here. So one of the things about Chronicling America that makes it unique is that there is, uh, it's free. There's no login, there's no strings attached. You just go to the website um, and you have access to all of this material. Um, so this is what you'll see when you, when you come here. Um, if you're looking just to do a basic search, this is the area where you will do it. You can um, sort by state. There's a drop down list by year, and then you search for a keyword, um, which will bring you. Let's just search for diamond. Um, oh, sorry, I didn't. Let me go back diamond to State. Arkansas. <laughs> mm -hmm. Let me look just in Arkansas. Okay, so there's over 27,000 hits for diamond in Arkansas newspapers. Um, as you can see, it highlights them in pink. So you can see how many hits are on a single page. Um, Good Lord, the Woodruff County News is not filthy with diamonds. Yes. Wow. <laughs> um, if you're looking for something more advanced, this is for a broad search, um, but if you're looking for something more advanced, you're gonna go to the advanced search feature. Depending on what you're looking for, the information that you know uh, or don't know, this is where you'll go. Um, you could sort by newspaper. You can look for a specific date. Um, and there are boxes down here which allow you to um, search for uh, your keywords in different ways. Each of these will bring back different results. Um, if you want to see all of the Arkansas newspapers, you click on the All Digitized Newspapers tab and sort by Arkansas. This will bring up the list. Right here it says there's 90. There's actually 89. One of these at the very bottom is attributed to us, but is actually a Missouri newspaper. Um, so this list um, kind of gives you an overview of each of the titles, the number of issues we have, um, the earliest and latest dates for that. And then this column over here called more info is significant. We're gonna go into the state press. Um, this is where you'll learn on the left side, this information is pulling from the US newspaper directory, which is the result of the US newspaper programs cataloging. Um, this gives you great information about the paper, who published it, where it was published, dates, how often it was published, and then subject matter. Another fun feature down here is the holdings. This is how um, you can locate things in the state. Or, or not necessarily in the state. Um, this says we have the microfilm, the master for Arkansas State Press. Mm -hmm. um, it will show you other people that have service copies. Um, this is a good way to locate information if you're not sure where it is. On the right side, you'll see an essay with every newspaper title that we um, add to Chronicling America, we research and create an essay on the history of the paper. Um, this is uh, really great information, really interesting stories that come from this about, you know, rival papers, dueling, um, you know, important events that were covered, um, the changing, uh, oftentimes papers, newspapers changed hands, they were sold, someone died. Um, so this kind of gives you a, a, a very brief overview of all of that. So that's important to read um, if, you're, if you're interested in the paper itself. You can look by calendar view at all of the issues. Aren't a number of those um, newspaper biographies going up on the Encyclopedia of Arkansas? That is correct. We are working with the Encyclopedia of Arkansas to um, create entries for, for ones that are not already up. Um, so yes, and they'll link back to Chronicling America at some point. Which... Um, so um another option for viewing is to use the interactive map feature so if you're on the home page you click, click on uh, maps and visualizations 
It's this first option right here, view interactive map, which allows you to look at um, the newspapers. <laughs> Let me zoom in here. Um, this shows you what we've digitized across Arkansas so far. Um, each dot represents a, a place where there is a newspaper or multiple newspapers. Obviously, uh, Little Rock has, I think we, I think I saw it was 25 or something digitized so far. Um, if you hover over the blue dots or click on the blue dots, I'll do Pine Bluff. Um, at the bottom here, you can say, see there's, um, oops, one of five. So there's five papers digitized from Pine Bluff currently. And if you uh, click click through, you'll be able to access. You can click on these links to access that way. Um, we uh, have created some research guides to help you. If you can't remember what we talked about today, um, we have an eight page guide, a comprehensive research guide uh, to let you know how to use those boxes. All of those boxes, uh, as I mentioned, give you different results. Um, so we have tips and tricks about research or uh, search terms, things like that in this guide. We also have a quick guide, which is a one page um, just to get you started on, uh, on your research. All of the resources can be found here. Um, we have a specific web page for our project. It includes um, promotional materials, which we've created. Uh, posters and flyers. Um, if if you're at an institution and you can hang them up, you can download them directly. <laughs> help us promote the project. Um, you Stick can get them in bathrooms and libraries. Yes, please. Uh, read the research guides we created, and then we're also creating topic guides. We have um, six that are completed. Um, they cover subject specific uh, themes around the state of Arkansas, for instance. Um, uh, race riots in Arkansas, the apple industry in Arkansas. Um, these guides give an overview of the topic and common search word terms, um, significant dates, uh, links to resources and lesson plans, and then also links to Chronicling America uh, articles that we've already researched. So this is a good way to um, get into a topic if you're not already familiar with it. And more are coming soon once I quit editing them because exactly. they made they made the, I didn't want to say they they made the mistake of sending me topic guides on subjects I know something about. And no. Don't it's let's <laughs> let's just say I'm having too much fun with them. <laughs> so uh, it's all my fault. So here are some of the links to MB NDMP if you're wanting to read more about it. Chronicling America takes you to the website. And again, this is our webpage. Um, our blog is on uh, the Arkansas State Archives, which I don't have listed here. Um, and then we have email addresses for David and I, if you're interested in contacting us, we'd love to hear what you're researching, what you're using Chronicling America for. Uh, if you have a group that's interested in research, and you would like us to speak, we'd be happy to do that. If you can think of some resources that maybe we haven't created yet, we'd love to know. Um, we also have a presence on uh, social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. If you follow us, we take over, our, our team takes over on Thursdays and um, promotes the project, share uh, new content being posted and um, fun, fun things. We don't often get to read the actual papers, uh, which you would <laughs> you wouldn't think when you're working with newspapers, but um, this gives us a chance to see what's actually in the papers and share fun, fun, interesting things, timely, timely things. Um, so I'm going to turn it back over to David to wrap it up. A few, a few, a few points. Um, a couple of years ago, my, my, my friend and neighbor, Charlie Bolton book, um, Fugitivism came out. And we were talking while we were both mowing our lawns one evening, and he was shaking. He says, my God, I can do my research on my kitchen table because he had discovered the joy of getting access to newspapers via his, his computer and doing keyword searches, which had made it possible for him to, uh, during the pandemic to get a lot of research done right in, in his home. Um, I, can't, I can't overstate the 
opportunities this is making available, especially for anyone who's interested in American history topics of the 19th or the early 20th century. Um, we are part of a program, moreover, that doesn't simply digitize what's what's available. Um, instead, this is a this is a nationwide program of curated newspaper listings or inclusions. That is not simply getting what's there, but instead selecting newspapers to represent the widest geographical representation, the widest population representation, representation of underserved groups, minority groups when possible. The idea is to get as broad a field as coverage as possible. Now, if you if you went back to that map of Arkansas showing the spots, you see some spots where there aren't any, any dots, some areas that say, there aren't that many newspapers or the newspapers that were microfilmed. Um, the, they may not have. They may not have um, had, had complete runs, or the runs may have been poorly filmed. It's frustrating. We're working to try to fill in those gaps. That's the idea of this next cycle. Um, we we may be talking about natural resources and relationship to the land, but what we're really trying to do is at the same time fill in the gaps in coverage with an effort to make this the most representative, inclusive possible body of newspapers made available. Now, a friend of mine asked me um, a, a few months ago, well, why don't you just put them up online yourself? Well, has he paid for server space lately? <laughs> has he paid for cloud storage? Um, we are part of essentially a giant consortium, a run through the Library of Congress. There's economies of scale, um, that are possible at the federal level that we poor states can't dream of. Uh, we have our own web offerings, and we know that it's uh, the current platform is sort of, cum sort of cumbersome. Our website, you know, we're not web people for the most part. Um, I'm an historian. Katie is a brilliant photographer and artist who also has a head for detail and organization and is fearless when dealing with our vendors. My hat is off to you. Um, <laughs> On Tuesday morning, when we have our meetings, we get to hear the, um, let's say, the fresh saga of they did what <laughs> again. And it's it's her persistence uh, that is making this third cycle um, a, a success. Um, because our vendors, they're good people. They mean well. But sometimes when you're communicating between Jersey and California and where, where overseas? Cambodia. Cambodia. Gambia. Yeah, we come from a lot of time zones. Uh, Some things get lost in translation. <laughs> Katie catches them. But the thing is that the Library of Congress giving this overarching framework makes it possible for us to focus on the content. Let some, you know, other people have worked out the technical details of making it available to people. We get to focus on getting the good stuff, good, putting it in the best condition possible, getting it digitized, going back, getting it redigitized. Come on, guys, try a third time. Uh, pay attention to the proofreading corrections this time, and then providing it to the Library of Congress. Um, our, our editorial board or advisory board have helped us uh, point us point us towards some um, holes in our coverage. We're trying to address these in this fourth cycle. If we get if we get approved, we won't know until August. Until then, we've got work to do. We've got topic guides to get out. I've got topic guys to get out of my computer and give back to these guys. Um, this is a neat, rich resource. It is, it is free admission. No keywords, no trying to remember your subscription to newspapers.com. Um, it's out there and it actually works. I have found things for my own research that I never thought I'd be able to find without endless hours of sitting up in Cheyenne, Wyoming, in their state archives, in their microfilm department, Hey, I'll take it. I'll work from home on this one. So this is something where I'm in awe of what's been accomplished. Um, microfilm, I may have in my heart, but you know, sometimes thing, sometimes new is better. This is great for preservation. This makes access a breeze. It's a partnership of very mature technology and evolving technology. And for someone who doesn't want to feel like a superannuated former historian, you got to embrace the new stuff. 
And I'm thankful that I have staff who are actually conversant enough with this so they make me feel like I'm actually almost understanding it and can make good use of it. So, Katie, what, what more do we need to tell these folks? Uh, we are we ready for, for questions. questions. Yes. How would you characterize the progress of the various states when compared, so compared with, say, Arkansas? Or, in other words, if I understand, it, you got the national organization and then you have individual states that are in various states yep. of implementing the program. Yep. How, how is Arkansas doing or how what what can you tell us about that? Um, can we please repeat the question for people in the audience there that they can't really hear? So if you can just yeah, you don't have to say the whole thing just repeat okay. it a little bit for you can thank you. The question was one of how does Arkansas compare in terms of other state uh, to other states in terms of our progress as um, as being members of this project, is that did I get did I right. get that right? Right. Um, and you would say so. The project, as I mentioned, began in 2005 with the first states getting funded. I don't know exactly what those states are. Darren probably knows better than I do. Um, but we are all at different stages. Um, essentially, each state is I don't want to say guaranteed, but essentially each state is guaranteed three cycles. Um, after that, it becomes competitive. So most states have done about three cycles or are working towards those three cycles. After that, it gets more competitive and uh, more thematic. Um, and so there are some states, larger states like California that have done, I think what like six, six cycles perhaps is the most. That, um, so somewhere in between three to six is typical, like I said, Massachusetts just joined, so they're very late in the process, but we were considered late too in joining in 2017. Um, so they're all at different places. Some of them were early on and stopped at three. Um, that doesn't mean they can't join again later if they find more content. Um, it really has to do with what you have access to and your willingness to manage a grant, a federal grant. <laughs> Let's, let's not talk about that. This, we're trying to keep this family friends. <laughs> My second question is, uh, has to do with what is being done to let the man on the street, the average fellow, know about the availability of this resource. Okay, the question is, what's being done to publicize this, to, to make people aware of this service? of this opportunity? And the answer is, as much as we can get away with. <laughs> um, yeah, events like this, where we can come in and share the information, we try to use our social media accounts to do that. Um, we piggyback on the Arts and State Archives blogs um, and try to put blogs out to promote the project. Um, we create content, we send out content across the state. We recently created posters and flyers and did a mass mailing to all the libraries across the state. I hope every single library has the posters up and the flyers out for people. I, I have seen them. I have heard that they are up. Um, we are doing whatever we can. Um, and with, with events like this, uh, word of mouth, um, we hope that people are starting to hear about it. Uh, it's a slow process. But As I understand this, what you used to have to go to the Arkansas Archives and state capital, you can now get on your own. Yes. Yeah, the, the question is, this is stuff that used to have to come to the state archives to look at? Yes. Um, don't worry, there's plenty of stuff that's not going up on this. You can still come to the state archives okay. and consult. We're friendly. We're looking for visitors. This has drastically changed how people are going to do research. How do you do it? How do you access the thing digitally? So the way we newspapers.com is that newspapers.com is a competitor of ours. Uh, uh, no, 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 not a competitor. We're we're we're, we're that's right. Yeah. They're not in our league. Um, that's all. So <laughs> no, but it's uh, newspapers.com, as you can tell by the suffix, it's a pay for service. You can access newspapers.com through the Central Arkansas Library, only on site, right? And or, only a few titles. And only a few titles. Well, the Little Rock, this library has a microfilm mm -hmm. library. Yes. And so 
Do you all have the same the exact? No, we don't. We have it. We have it. I, I don't want to sound like a judge. We have a bigger one. We got more film. Okay. We got so much film. <laughs> this library has got the two local newspapers, the Gazette and the Democrat. It, this is the local focus. We have a statewide focus. All right, well, let me ask, let me ask this. If I want to look up something in the newspaper in 1934, mm -hmm. can I go to your website and so try let to me find that show you very quickly how you would do that. Um, so you go to chroniclingamerica.llc.gov. Right here, this is the website you would go to. Right here at the top. If you want to search just for um, Arkansas newspapers, you can search this way. If you're looking for a specific name or um, subject, as I mentioned earlier, uh, I just looked up Diamond, but if you know if you're looking for 1934, you could isolate the dates here, put in your keyword. Um, I've, I've looked for multiple things, um, and then you run your search, and that will pull up all the newspapers related to. You have a written thing, so we know how to do this. I do. I got, we have a guide to use in America. I have a merchandise table over here for you to take uh, information with you, and uh, that should help you. And thank you for asking that question, because people like me would rather have something on in hand on paper, even when we're facing a computer, because I can only remember so many notes scribbled on my phone before I run out of space. There, it's it's something that you get you get you get comfortable with it with use. The first few times, sort of, what am I doing? End up on the archives website. Don't worry. And if you want to use microfilm, come on down to our offices in Big Mac. We're still open five days a week and occasional Saturdays. So we we can make you suffer the old fashioned way. Well, I've <laughs> used the microfilm here in this library to mm -hmm. look up something that was back in the four, middle forties. Yeah, and it it took me a little bit of get used to figure out how to do it, but they were very helpful. I mean, this was several years ago. This will be much more instant than uh, once you know how to use the, the website, it will pull back the, you don't have to scroll through. It makes it uh, a lot easier for you. Thing is that with practice, you learn how to not get that 27,000 hit basket. <clears throat> yeah. um, uh, once, once, you, once you figured out how to use those search boxes, you can narrow it down so it gets you closer to what you want, and you don't have to read those 20 extra pages per issue rather than the one page that has something that you want. Um, there was one great question from Zoom I wanted to make sure we touched on because I think it will help inform some of this okay. what is available in mind, what isn't. Sure. Um, someone asked, what are the plans um, for more current publications? They saw that the last publication date is 1963 in time America. Okay. Which is a um, copyright related question. Mm -hmm. Our latest, the latest publication that we have from Arkansas on this is what? 1959. That's the, the, the end of the, the Bates era of the Arkansas State Press. Most of our newspapers um, end in presently, what, 1927, 27. although Das Echo. Um, go, goes forward into the early 1930s. Why is this? Because of copyright. Um, you run up against copyright limitations. You have intellectual property that stays active for how many years? 75. 75. Thank Not you. 75. Sure. Yeah. Okay. It's it's it. It has been a. It is. It has been encouraged. It's, we've been encouraged to keep our. To keep our. Additions to Chronicling America within the no question uh, copyright range. That's why it it dies off uh, some somewhere in somewhere in the um, Coolidge and Hoover era. So other 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 states put up more recent things. But again, 1963, getting too close, getting into copyright intellectual property issues. It's a limitation. Uh, the thing is that many newspapers have their own archives for more recent things available. Um, often on a pay uh, a, a a pay basis, uh, we can't we can't afford that. <laughs> All right. 
Well, I think we're about out of time. Do we have any last questions in the room? Yeah. Is, is the unconditional union on your, your list of uh, papers to digitize? Derek, it is, isn't it? Did we, we looked at, we have we, looked at We it. looked at that. And if it will, and if it will be digitized, we will try to fit that in for a fourth cycle, but we have several different versions of union newspapers in, from the Civil War era on chronically American already. And I just, and I just want to ask since you uh, since you asked um, about a Civil War era newspaper, from uh, the the Library of Congress will be hosting a webinar in a few weeks next week next week mm -hmm. on how to use chronically America in Civil War resources throughout the whole country. They're they're partnering with the Georgia, uh, uh, with the Digital Library Library of Georgia to host that webinar. So we'll post it. We'll share that uh, details of that on our social media. Follow up. Yeah, that, that that reminds me. We have we have our own war sesquicentennial yeah. coming up, don't we? The Brooks Baxter War of eighteen seventy four. Do we need to do a webinar on? Researching Arkansas's own civil war on front end. Yeah. All right, watch this space. Yeah. 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 Well, thank you so much for giving a round of applause. Uh, final announcement uh, we're going to have our next live season lunch, which will be Wednesday, June 7th at noon. Please keep an eye on our website and our newsletter for the location of that. We're not sure if we'll be able to meet in this room or not because of the main transition. So just keep an eye on that. Um, it will be somewhere in this general area, which is not positive on this space yet. And as always, you can join via Zoom. Um, it will be Blake Wintry, and he will be presenting on the Dimity family. Um, James W. Dimity and his son Josiah, who were two Arkansas Unionists during the Civil War. They also were documented as watchmakers and jewelers in historic Arkansas Museum's Arkansas Made Project. Attendees will gain insight into the Dimby's family's unique experiences and perspectives of unionists in Arkansas during the Civil War and Reconstruction. Also, be sure to visit our website to learn about our other events and programs that we have going on. So, thank you so much. Thank you.